I'm Eileen Galuli, and I'd like to welcome you today to today's event, Scholarly Societies in the Humanities, New Models and Innovation. This is the uh, third of four events in our Research Without Borders speaker series for the 2012-13 academic year, which is sponsored by Columbia Scholarly Communication Program and Digital Humanities Center. And I was just going to ask, when is the fourth one, just so people can get it on their calendars? April 4th. Uh, so the fourth and last event in the series. Um, I'm going to introduce all the speakers uh, now, and then each of them will sp speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, um, which will leave us enough time for discussion and questions from the audience. So please do hold whatever questions you have until all the speakers have presented. And when you do ask questions, please remember that we're videotaping and webcasting the event today. So do use the microphone um, in the middle of the room right there um, so we can hear your questions on the video. Thanks. Um, and now I'll introduce the panelists. We're going, I think, in this order. Um, so the first speaker um, will be Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Um, Kathleen is Director of Scholarly Communications at the Modern Language Association. She's the author of Planned Obsolescence, Publishing, Technology, and the Future of the Academy, which was released in draft form for open peer review in fall of 2009 before being published in traditional, more traditional uh, f formats in 2011. She's also co-founder of the digital scholarly network Media Commons and was instrumental in the launch of the MLA Commons in January of 2013. Diane Harris is director of the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities and professor of landscape architecture, uh, architecture, art history, and history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her most recent book is Little White Houses, How the Post-War Home Constructed Race in America. She's the past president for the Society of Architectural Historians, where she also served as editor-in-chief for Sahara, a major Mellon Foundation-funded digital humanities initiative. And our final speaker will be Robert Townsend, who's deputy director of the American Historical Association, where he has served as director of publications for the past 15 years. In addition to his work in the publishing area, he's the author or co-author of over 200 articles on various aspects of history, higher education, and electronic publishing. And he's just published a, history, a book called History's Babel, Scholarship and Professionalization in the Historical Enterprise. Please help me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you, and sorry for that little delay. Uh, the title of my talk today originates from a comment that was originally um, made by Bill Cronin, um, who was then, at the time, the president-elect of the American Historical Association. We were at uh, an, a meeting of the Scholarly Communication Institute in 2011, um, and in discussing what had you know, been com come to be referred to as the digital humanities, um, Cronin suggested that there was a bit of a problem with the term as it seems to suggest that there is some other branch of the humanities that's analog and therefore that need not be party to the kinds of discussions that we were having. Um, a better concept, he suggested, would be this notion of the humanities in and for the digital age, um, which begins to make clear that all fields and all subfields are being affected by the new technologies that many of us are working with increasingly intimately. Uh, my own work over the last several years has been focused on, in, in large part, on getting those parts of the humanities that most feel themselves to be analog, um, to understand how it is, in fact, that they are already digital, and how the digital is changing their work, whether in visible or in invisible ways. Well, one of the primary arenas for that change is in scholarly communication. Um, it's, it's probably not a surprise I would say that, given my job title. Um, I joined the staff of the Modern Language Association in July of 2011 in order to help the association and its members think about the changes that were taking place in scholarly communication across the profession. Right? As scholars increasingly move from a sole focus on the production of books and journal articles to a much more fluid range of modes of communication. So I want to start out by giving you a little bit of the background that explains how I came to these issues, um, a story that I think in several ways might be emblematic of the kinds of change that lots of us are experiencing across the fields, um, before turning to talk a bit about where we at the MLA are headed. So um, the short version of the recap. 
what feels like a very long time ago now, I finished a dissertation um, that focused on the relationship between the contemporary American novel and television. Um, I was lucky enough to find a tenure track job, and so I, I started doing the thing that you need to do, right, when you have that tenure track job. I began the process of converting that dissertation into a book. So as I had been advised to, I sent out queries to um, university presses. Um, there were not quite that many queries, but wanted to see who might be interested in this project. Um, and I worked and I waited. And the three presses that I was most interested in um, were, in fact, interested in the project. And they said that I should send the full manuscript as soon as it was ready. Now, unfortunately, as soon as it was ready, it took a little bit longer than I was expecting when I started this position. Um, starting a new assistant professorship at a small liberal arts college took a lot of time. And then there's the writing is hard part of this. Um, turning that dissertation into a book was just not as simple a process as I expected it to be. Um, but it did finally get done. And about three years after that initial round of queries, I started writing back to the presses that had been interested in the dissertation, not entirely realizing that the bursting of the dot-com bubble, which had happened in the meantime, um, was going to have an effect. Uh, but it did, right? The, the response from all three presses this time out was pretty much the same. This is a great project, and we really think it's smart, but we can't afford to publish it right now. Right? So I scrambled a little bit, and I sent out a bunch more queries, and I got more of the same response. Um, one press finally did ask to see the manuscript and sent it out to reviewers and got two positive readers' reports and had an editor who was super enthusiastic about the project. But after holding on to it for nearly a year, the press finally declined. Um, the editor had been overruled on the editorial board by the marketing guys who said that the project posed too much financial risk to pursue in the current economy. Now, this particular cause for rejection prompted two immediate responses among the people around me, um, the first of which was most clearly articulated by my mother, who said they were planning on making money off of your book. <laughs> I mean, the fact is they were, right? Not much, perhaps, but that the press involved needed the book to make money, at least enough to return its costs, and that it doubted that it would, right, highlights the serious economic problems that scholarly publishing continues to face up to this day. I mean, there's no small irony, though, in the fact that I was facing this particular problem with this book, as the argument in the book was precisely that the book was not a dying form, right, and that claims that it is often serve quite conservative ends, um, shoring up very traditional cultural hierarchies against infiltration by mass culture. And yet here I was, um, starting to wonder whether the academic book might be facing a kind of death, one that had less to do with any decline in our need for it than in our ability to support it going forward. Now, as it turns out, after about another year and a half of sending out fruitless queries, um, I finally did find a fabulous press to publish the book with. Um, but the whole intervening mess had me still wondering whether there might be a better way, right? After all, right after I had finished the revisions on the manuscript, a good five years before the book finally came into print, um, feeling a little impatient about wanting to get some ideas into circulation now, I started a blog. And that blog, which is coming up on its 11th anniversary now, um, helped me develop an audience, a community, well in advance of any of my traditional publications. So while the first response to that rejection that I'd gotten um, was my mother's somewhat bewildered disbelief, um, the second response was instead about possibilities. As my friend Matt Kirschenbaum asked me in a comment, which you probably cannot read from back there, um, on a blog post that I'd written about the debacle, why couldn't I simply take the manuscript and the two positive readers reports and put the whole thing online, right, voila, peer-reviewed publication? Now, Matt backed down from that possibility, saying that he, could, he understood why it wasn't realistic, but I didn't entirely. I mean, why not start a whole new kind of online publishing network, one that might actually learn something from the dynamic scholarly communities that blogging had created? Why not remake scholarly publishing into something that actually works? Now, if you're thinking at this point that this makes me sound like some kind of starry-eyed optimist, um, you may not be wrong. The connections that I'd found through this early community of academic bloggers really gave me hope, right? These were supportive colleagues who were working together and thinking ideas through. Um, blogging in those early days helped me forge this little utopian intentional community online, and maybe I thought some of the things that I'd found there could be generalized outward. 
So working with the Institute for the Future of the Book, um, my co-editor, Avi Santo, and I founded Media Commons, um, which is a network in which scholars in media studies could discuss and share their work together and develop new kinds of collaborations. Uh, Media Commons has now been up and running for the better part of five years, and it's developed a number of projects, including in Media Res, in which five scholars every week post a brief media clip and comment for open discussion. Um, similarly, the new Every Day is a kind of experiment in middle state publishing, working with articles that are slightly longer and more developed than blog posts, but not quite sealed into the fixity of the journal article. Um, Alt Academy remediates the edited volume and the journal as a space for lengthier ongoing discussion about a particular issue. And Media Commons Press is publishing longer texts for open discussion. Now, working on Media Commons was extremely gratifying, um, but it made clear to me very quickly how difficult changing a culture can be. Um, getting scholars and administrators and publishers and institutions all to invest their time and effort and resources in new ways of working requires, in many cases, changing the ways that the people involved think, right? The things that they prioritize and the ways that they assign value to the products of academic labor. In other words, I started realizing that the primary changes that needed to be made in the academy today were less technological than they were social. Right? New publishing networks really needed to be accompanied by new understandings of the purposes of scholarly communication and the ways that it might best be facilitated today. So I started doing a bunch of writing on my blog and elsewhere about how humanities scholars working in and for the digital age might start thinking differently about things like peer review or about the nature of authorship or about the shape of scholarly texts and so on. And all of that writing finally culminated in planned obsolescence, which came out from NYU Press in 2011. And yes, I do realize the irony in, in publishing that in book form. Um, but again, it was like getting to that analog humanities that I really needed to, um, I felt like I really needed to reach. In any case, um, just as I was finishing up the book, this extremely weird thing happened. Um, someone came, it's weird within the humanities at least, right? Someone came up to me and said, these are some interesting ideas you've got. Let's see if they work. Um, that never happens. Uh, but the Office of Scholarly Communication was established by the Executive Council of the Modern Language Association um, in 2011 and was charged with bringing together and reimagining the existing book publishing program and the web editorial functions. Um, this new structure is meant to grapple with the growing understanding that scholarly communication, in the sense that's broader than publishing per se, is the very foundation of what scholarly societies do. Do, right? The purpose that they have had since the Royal Society of London, for which they've been founded. And given that, the new office touches every part of the organization, um, from its continuing publishing activities, of course, but also to member relations and policy and the convention. The office has two primary responsibilities. Um, the first of which is to think about the future of our book publications as our means of production and distribution become increasingly digital. And secondly, to think about the born digital platforms uh, for the new kinds of communication that our members are gonna want to engage in and will need us to support in order to facilitate their developing scholarly practices. So the relatively easy part of that first area involves exploring the ways that our print projects might best circulate as ebooks, right? and, and as well as taking projects that to this point have only existed in print and thinking about how the digital might enable new and better kinds of interaction with them. Um, for example, last year we conducted the first New Variorum Shakespeare Digital Challenge um, in which we released the XML from our most recent Variorum volume under a Creative Commons license and encouraged scholars to produce the most exciting interface or API or visualization that they could using it, uh, enabling us to see more of what the future possibilities for the Variorum might be. Now, there's, of course, a lot that remains to be figured out on this end of our, of our charge. Um, huge questions about sustainable business models and open access loom large ahead of us, but at least we do know what those questions are. Um, the other half of our charge is a good bit more complicated and a good bit more fuzzy, right? Not only are these born digital platforms themselves always in development, right? It's like trying to draw a moving target. Um, but their adoption requires a new perspective on the role of the scholarly society in the digital age. 
Um, it's possible that the locus of value of the scholarly society to its members is shifting from providing those members with closed access to the products of the society to instead facilitating the broadly open distribution of the work that its members are doing. And this is an enormous change, right, from one in which you're motivated to join the society in order to get its journal to one instead where you're motivated to join the society in order to get your work into distribution, into a conversation that's taking place within that group. So we've chosen to start thinking about these born digital platforms and how they might create new relationships with and among our members by building MLA Commons, um, which is a platform that was launched just a few weeks back at the convention in Boston. Um, MLA Commons is designed to support a wide range of forms of member-to-member -member communication, collaboration, feedback, and publishing. And we're extremely grateful to have received a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support that work. We've also benefited an enormous amount um, from the generosity of the CUNY Academic Commons team, who are in turn supported by the Sloan Foundation in generalizing the model that they built for our use. Um, the CUNY Academic Commons has developed a robust platform for complex scholarly communication. Um, they link faculty and graduate students on all of the CUNY campuses around New York. And they've now developed that platform that they were working with into what they're calling the Commons in a Box, um, for which MLA is one of the first major partners. Um, the common software is entirely open source. Um, the base platform is the popular blog engine WordPress, and it's running with the social network plugin BuddyPress on top of it, plus a host of associated plugins. And the Commons team has its eye on what its projects can give back to those developer communities. Um, we at the MLA, in turn, have the goal of generalizing the model that we're developing, opening the platform to other organizations and associations. Um, now, any member of the MLA can currently activate their account on the Commons, and with that account, they can create a profile. Now, that profile will allow them to join discussion groups, to publish an individual blog or work on a group blog, to post and share documents, to work collaboratively on projects, and a number of other things besides. Um, groups on the Commons can be open or closed membership, and they can do their work openly or in private. And in this way, Commons groups can support the work of MLA committees um, and of the existing divisions and discussion groups within the organization. And, um, but it can also support the work of ad hoc groups of scholars who come together around particular kinds of projects. And this, we really believe, um, is going to help us begin to develop a more fluid structure for the organization itself, right, that will enable groups to come together and sort of fade away as they are needed. Um, blogs at MLA Commons are open outlets on which individual members or groups of members are able to share their work and communicate with a range of broader publics. And the site also provides a range of other ways for members to connect with one another, to publish their work, to collaborate on new projects, and to discuss the issues that matter to them. Um, so we're hoping that there'll be lots of unfiltered open content that get produced in the network. But we're also thinking about how the future of the Commons is a formal publication platform might develop as well. And so we're producing a set of workflows that will enable groups to implement um, more formalized modes of editorial filtering, highlighting and aggregating the best stuff that's going on within their subfields, for instance. So in this line, um, we've released what we're thinking of as an evolving anthology, right? Our first entirely online publication, Literary Studies in the Digital Age, um, which unlike an edited print volume of that sort, will be able to grow and change over time. And we're hoping that our divisions and discussion groups will similarly begin to serve this kind of editorial function, that they will take charge of producing, for instance, for the, the group on 19th century American literature, an anthology of the work that is being done within that that field. And we hope that this might result in the development of what we might think of as a form of post-publication peer review for the kinds of openly uh, published content that's being produced within the network. So the site is still in beta at this point, and um, we're seeking active input from our membership on the directions for its future development. And we have on our agenda a range of projects that will enable the Commons to connect with other major MLA resources, including the convention, as well as other kinds of um, resources that are out there in the humanities universe. 
But we've spent a lot of time um, thinking about what I think is going to be the most important question that we face, um, which is how to create buy-in amongst the membership for using this platform. Other sc scholarly societies have attempted to roll out platforms for member communication, only to discover that if you build it, they will not necessarily come. Um, users face profile fatigue, um, and those most likely to adopt online modes of communication often already feel that their needs are being met through their existing channels. So we're trying to imagine this launch as part of an extended testing process, um, gathering information about what our members do and don't need in the platform, as well as um, thinking of it as a means of encouraging early adopters to help us out by creating some exciting content and, and thereby demonstrate what the platform can do. We're also talking a great deal about how we can get members to come build the kind of community that I found in those early days of blogging, how they might make this platform genuinely their own to do with the things that they want to do. Because my sense really is that a network like this one will come of age finally when its users do things with it that we can't possibly predict. Um, they might, for instance, want to use a, a, a service like Press Forward in order to aggregate stuff going on in the web and develop new modes of peer review that are partly algorithmic, partly editorial, um, that will work within the, the kinds of open review modes that we've recently completed a study of at um, Media Commons and NYU Press. It was a joint Mellon-funded study, the final white paper of which is available online. So we'll, you know, MLA Commons will have the opportunity to learn from this project. And we're also actively thinking about how our platform will be able to connect to other major projects that are taking place in scholarly communication right now, such as Scalar, which uh, allows the, the production of really robust multimedia projects. Um, as our partnership with CUNY might suggest, we have no interest in reinventing the wheel, right? We want to build on the strengths within the community and find collaborations that will help us all move forward. And we're also thinking about how a network like this one might be a way that, that scholarly societies can help further the goals of open access, right? Realizing the value that they pr provide to their members by helping them get that work out into the world where it can have the greatest possible public benefit and produce the greatest possible public interest in the work that's being done in the humanities. So we're looking for more ways to, to connect with our fellow scholarly societies um, and to expand this network in truly interdisciplinary ways. Um, there's a ton more to be talked about, but I want to move on, and I hope that we can talk more about all of this in discussion. Thanks again for having me here. So the Society of Architectural Historians, um, hey, <laughs> for which I, I uh, am a recent past president, is a much smaller uh, learned society than the MLA. We have about 2,300 individual members and maybe another 13 to 1,500, I think, institutional members. Um, so a big annual meeting for the SAH is 600, 650 people. So it's a much more, um, I think that that size actually has made it possible for the society to do some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about today. It's kind of nimble scholarly society. Um, and, uh, I, uh, they also have this kind of long lead in ladder. There's a six year uh, ladder that our officers go through. So uh, we spend two years as second vice president, two years as first vice president, and then two years of, as president. And I started as second vice president in 2006, which coincides exactly when the society really became um, deeply engaged in these kinds of digital humanities projects. So. Actually, the first thing I want to do, and I may need to ask Catherine to come back and help me find it, because I'm a Mac user, um, is the, there's a little video. You may not be able to hear it. Every year, people who are interested in architecture and landscape architecture and city planning history from around the world gather for the meeting of the Society of Architectural Historians. You get to visit a city and explore its architecture Part of the inducement of coming is not just to see old friends, but to see new places. In several editions over the course of um, his lifetime, as his... I think the opportunity to come to Detroit was remarkable for us because it is a city with a really rich history, but it's also a city that's been in the press a lot lately for what is happening right now. This is an organization that plays a critical mediating role. We bring together people in the general public, scholars, independent scholars, people who are themselves architects, to talk about 
the history of architecture in order to think in new ways about decisions that will be made in the present day about architecture around the world. The Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians is the publication of record for the discipline of the history of architecture, urbanism, and the built environment. And so having multimedia content along with those scholarly articles is just another way of sort of ramping up the level of the content that's there. Together with Sahara and the digitization of the buildings of the United States and the expansion of that into Archipedia, SAH is leading the world in developing an integrated systems of scholarly communication that make the most of the new capacities of international electronic communication. I think by developing new models of content contribution within the Archipedia, we can in fact capture the excellent scholarship that a younger generation is doing using the building histories as a way, in fact, of contributing new scholarship. I first joined SAH before I started my graduate studies. Um, I knew that it would be a great opportunity to start to see how the field operates in a way and how other scholars interact with each other. I applied for the SAH fellowship to visit India to actually see the buildings. Studying them through photographs is one thing, but actually visiting them I knew would change the way that I perceived the spaces. I went from feeling like an outsider where people already knew each other, people on the SAH tours go on SAH tours year to year to year, to being in the fold quickly. <laughs> you know, you sort of become part of a community when you come to the meetings and, and get to know folks from across the country and, and also international students. I've had many opportunities to discuss my own work or, or discuss uh, someone else's work and, and learn something that I can take away. It's in the SAH that the conversations take place, the connections take place. I think the organization has transformed itself and has become much broader, much more inclusive. I feel confident that SAH is going to keep innovating and keep on the cutting edge. There's a kind of shared interest and shared purpose that makes it really magical. So that gives you a sense of the activities of the society, which actually matters in terms of thinking about some of the projects that we're trying to do now. So between 2008 and 2012, SAH launched three online academic resource sources that provide, um, we hope, a new model for peer review and academic publishing. And what I'm going to talk about is basically the, the three major projects that kind of overlapped with my time working at SAH. Um, the, the production of our uh, multimedia online platform for our journal. Um, the creation of Sahara, the shared uh, digital image archive hosted by ArtStore, and then Archipedia, which is um, now launching. All of the, and then I'll show you a few other things we've been doing. And I think that um, there are a number of lessons to be learned from the projects that we've been doing. And I think that they are innovative and they have transformed the society, as one of the members was talking about in that short video clip. But some of them also aren't going quite as we'd expected them to go. And for example, as Kathleen was just saying, we're learning that, for example, our members are a little bit less excited about some aspects of it than we are. So that's been an interesting lesson to learn. So um, I should back up first by saying that um, really all of our digital initiatives kind of can be traced back to the mid-1990s when one of our members, Jeffrey Cohn, who's at Bryn Mawr, launched uh, the SAH Image Exchange on our website, which was just this basically bucket that sat on the home page that um, people could contribute images to, but without any metadata, no control whatsoever, and um, they were not all that easy to retrieve. But still, I think Jeff deserves a lot of credit for having thought about that at a really, really early phase. Um, in 2005 and 2006, um, Hilary Ballin and Marriott Westerman developed a white paper examining the current state of scholarly publishing. Um, art history and its publications in the electronic age. And this was funded by the Mellon Foundation to analyze um, both obstacles and affordances that were posed by digital environments for scholars working in art and architectural history, fields that rely very heavily on the use of high resolution, um, very, very, very sharp digital images to make their arguments. They're not supplementarily, supplementary to the argument. They actually are fundamental to the core of the argument. So that was a really important moment. And then in 2006, um, the Mellon Foundation hosted a scholarly communications institute at UVA that focused on digital scholarship and architectural history. That date coincides with when I started as second vice president. 
In 2008, um, SAH received two Mellon grants, one for the creation of the JSAH Online, the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians Online. Here's the print version of our journal. And the other for the creation of Sahara, which stands for Society of Architectural Historians Architecture Resources Archive, the digital image archive that I talked about. I'm just giving you kind of an overview timeline now. In 2010, NEH, uh, we got the NEH grant to start Archipedia, which was something, a big concept um, developed by our uh, executive director, Pauline Saliga. And then uh, the JSAH Online launched also in that year. In 2010, our then journal editor, David Brownlee, produced a set of video, tu video tutorials to teach people how to create multimedia content for the journal, which I'll show you in a minute. And then starting in 2012, the SAH started to offer small grants to help authors defray the costs of creating multimedia content for the journal. More on that in a minute. And then again in 2009 and 2010, we launched two different parts of Sahara. Um, and then uh, Archipedia started this year. So let me just run through some of these images and talk a little bit about these projects. Um, so the JSAH Online uh, was basically um, uh, it, the efforts of multiple multiple hands at work on it, but it's something that ultimately was produced. Um, uh, the technology partner was the University of California Press, and what you see here before you, this screenshot of the, the way it looks today, is not the way it looked a few years ago. Um, once it was completed, it got integrated into JSTOR's current scholarship program, and the template became a bit more rigid and the design less fluid. Um, but basically, the JSAH, JSAH Online allows scholars to include multimedia content with their journal articles. So you scroll down, um, you can either see a link embedded within the article or you can see these um, sort of along the side. And here you can just see some images that you're, you can click on a thumbnail and up comes a very high resolution image, whether it's a, a digital model or a digital recreation or uh, it, uh, we have QTVR panoramas that are embedded in it. You can embed video clips, you can embed, au embed audio clips and there are, the images are all high resolution zoomable images. So this is a wonderful thing, right? I mean for architectural historians to be able to have color images <laughs> alone was exciting. To have many, many more images illustrating our arguments was important. To be able to have um, three-dimensional digital images that you get models of, of buildings that you could then put on top of a Google Earth map was important. All of these things were great. The problem remains with the journal that um, we're having trouble getting content for it. So our scholars are still a bit slow to adopt this platform and it, well, they're, they're slow to adopt its affordances. Um, and so as I mentioned a minute ago, the former journal editor, David Brownlee, um, went about creating these videos. I'm just showing you a screenshot of them here, but you can go online and um, our members can learn how to prepare 3D models for the JSAH online or video clips or uh, how to prepare panoramic photographs so that hopefully this will help encourage them. And then of course there are those little grants, but, but it's, been, it's been slow. This is one of the frustrations and as one of the journal editors said to me, if only I could just get people to contribute color images, right? We're still so locked into thinking about the ways we've always contributed scholarship. It's my belief that the younger generation coming up behind us is going to be much more ready to adopt these kinds of um, formats when they produce their articles. We hope, we're not sure, we'll wait and see. We built it, we hope they will come. <laughs> um, the other, uh, as the second project and the one that kind of happened along the same time as the development of the JSH online is Sahara and you're seeing a screenshot of it here. Um, this was a project that we developed with ArtStore as our technology host and partner and again funded with a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation and Caroline Fabian who's here um, worked on us, uh, worked on this very, very closely with us in the early phases of the project. The idea behind Sahara was not just to create a shared image exchange where members could upload, catalog with a, a very scrupulously made um, metadata tool that's tailored to our field and share their images um, among each other, but it had two important sort of deeper components. <laughs> One of them was the idea that it would pioneer a new model of peer review so that when these images get uploaded, pairs of scholars and librarians would edit them and then if they made sure that the content was all accurate, they could be published to the next level. So the entry level is what we call member's choice, which everything goes into when you load it. The second level is this peer reviewed um, editor's choice and that's shared across the line with ArtStore. So ArtStore has that content as well. Um, and we had hoped originally that scholars would also contribute small um, uh, essays um, with their metadata that could then be peer-reviewed and published to the Editor's Choice Collection. This just shows you how you get into Sahara. 
Um, this gives you a sense of what the, the metadata schema that's called Imata looks like. Um, what, we're, what we found was that um, the scholars have not produced those miniature essays. Um, Sahara is, has gone pretty well. It currently has about 50,000 images um, in it that have been contributed by about 120 scholars. And the peer review system has been most successful for forging a new relationship between scholars and librarians because the librarians are very important equal partners in this with the scholars. They, we have a kind of a wonderful ratio of scholars to, to librarians on the editorial board for Sahara and they work very closely together. It's, it was at first imagined that sort of the, the work would go to scholars who would look at it and they'd pass it to librarians to fact check. But we're finding that it's a much closer and much more interesting working relationship than that. And the current co-editors in chief are, are a pair, a scholar and a librarian working together as the co-editors in chief. So I think that's been the most interesting and successful part of Sahara. As we were developing Sahara, and this just shows you what it looks like when you pull up a thumbnail um, in the collection. Um, you can see here the, the uh, very high resolution zoomable images. They are actually quite wonderful. They're easy to download. It's a pretty easy tool to, to get content out of. It's time consuming to put content into it. Um, this shows you the kind of the way the, the metadata looks when it's put in. You can look at the file properties and see a little bit more about it. Um, and then you can see here in this image that these are all QTVR panoramas, which for teaching architectural history is really important because you know you can click on the image and you saw it in the video that you could sort of, it, it allows you a 360 degree view of a space, which is incredibly important for teaching. Um, and this is one of those QTVRs, which I'm not gonna demonstrate. Here we are working in the art store office with part of the team. Um, but event, what was going on at the same time that we were developing um, Sahara is that art store was also developing its new platform shared shelf. And Sahara became essentially a kind of a test bed in a way that the beta version for shared shelf, um, which is about to launch, I think in June. And Sahara will, all the content from Sahara will be migrated over to shared shelf, which has some capabilities that Sahara doesn't have. Um, and so it was an interesting relationship to work with Art Store that way too, since they were developing something parallel but slightly different at the same time. Um, so this just shows you that it has, one of the great things about it is that you can do bulk uploads instead of the one at a time uploading that we do with Sahara. But it also has built in, so you, you, yeah, upload and describe multiple images at one time. But um, it has these integrated vocabularies as well so that it's gonna connect to um, some great systems for us that will make the work of putting in the metadata much easier and more standardized, I think. I also have heard, though I'm not sure this is true, that there will be an, a plug-in to Omeka. And if that's the case, that would be fantastic because you can take then content right out of Sahara, Sahara's shared shelf site and put it into Omeka and do all kinds of interesting things with it. Like, created online exhibits, which is something that we'd hoped would be an exciting part of Sahara from the beginning. Um, and then it's, you, you'll, so you'll work within the shared shelf environment, but publish the images to Sahara's shared shelf site. So I, I think this is something that everybody feels pretty proud of at this point. Um, this gives you a sense of the long list of people who are involved. So it's been a big effort. It's about a 30 member editorial team and all of these are SAH members who are working on this um, as volunteers. And um, so, you know, it's, a, it's something that we've got a pretty deep investment in and that um, it, we'll see how it goes when it moves to Shared Shelf. It's a little bit stalled right now because nobody wants to add more content until it gets migrated into Shared Shelf. So June will be a big day for us. And then finally, um, our executive director, who I can't say enough wonderful things about, Pauline Saliga, who is just a brilliant person, um, thought about, okay, we've got Sahara, we've got JSH online, we've been publishing these um, analog, these print vo volumes, the Buildings of the United States series for about a quarter of a century now. Um, we've got our society's newsletters that have a lot of rich content. And we have study tour notes from these incredible domestic international study tours that the society's been running for a long time. How could we find a way to get all of that content into one place, make all of these system, systems interoperable, and create a really amazing resource for both scholars, for high school teachers, for members of the general public to use? And so SAH Archipedia is really her baby. It was her vision. And as you can see, it's got a lot of funding partners, but a big NEH grant helped get, get it launched in, uh, a few years ago. And it's only really hit the airwaves in uh, January, so it's our brand new project. Um, and you can see that it's got two pieces to it. Um, one is SA this, the SAH Archipedia Classic Building. So when you see this on the website, this is the open access piece. Everything in it is free. Um, and it's got sort of content for hundreds sort of um, 
landmark buildings, buildings that the public are most likely to be interested in using. And then um, you can just see a little bit closer here. And then the, there's another piece to it that I'm not showing you, but that's for members only, that's by subscription and that has much more content embedded in it. And the hope is that eventually, right now, because it's been based largely on content taken from buildings of the United States, at least the text content, it's largely a US-focused project, but we're hoping that it will be a global um, resource in the future. Um, so that gives you a sense of how it's, it's got a lot of text content, it's all geo-coordinated, it's, um, it's full of illustrations that are taken from uh, uh, Sahara, and the UVA Press is our technology partner here, so they worked closely with the folks at Art Store and made an API or a workaround of some sort that would get content out of Sahara and into Archipedia. And then just a couple other things that the Society's been doing. Um, a few years back, I think the Pittsburgh or Cincinnati meeting was the first one where we did this at the annual meeting, um, grabbed some digital content about buildings that we had available uh, at the site of our annual meeting and put these, Q, uh, these QR tags up around town so that people could use their smartphones to take themselves on a, a self-guided walking tour to give inf information about the buildings. And that's, that's done really well. Um, that seems like something that people have really enjoyed. And people are getting, of course, much more used to using those QR tags at Best Buy or wherever, wherever they're going. And then this is a piece that I just was hearing from Kathleen. Um, I guess this might be getting shut down. I actually didn't know this, but SAH has been using um, a community site to let its members have the kinds of conversations that Kathleen was talking about, though in a kind of more simple way by creating these SAH groups through the community site, the group sites. And they haven't been super well embraced. I mean, I do, it's, I do get my little, you know, twice a week posting about what's going on in the communities, but it's, it's really not been heavily used. And I think it'd be interesting maybe for us to talk about why these things do or don't get used. But um, this is just to give you a sense of the different groups. So there's preservation, early modern architecture, landscape history, pedagogy, and so, so on. So they, they, all, they kind of identified around there. And you'll see sort of bursts of activity and then silence for a long time. Um, but all of this activity um, was exciting for the, the society. Our journal was called um, Online Journal 2.0 by Inside Higher Education a couple of years ago in 2010. And I think that's a, that, that platform, though much more of a template model and more rigid than something like Scalar, does, has been an important uh, accomplishment for the society because it made a platform that's now available to musicologists, to dance historians, to anybody who needs multimedia content with their online journals. So we're pretty proud of that. And then um, finally, we were listed as uh, technology innovators in the Chronicle of Higher Education recently. So all of that's been pretty exciting. And I think maybe the best uh, direction we could go in with this, and I probably don't need to show you the Archipedia video because I think I've explained it well enough and want to save time, but I think it would be interesting to talk about what kinds of platforms have been more readily taken up by members, why that might be, what's been left behind and why that might be, and we'll see where it goes from there. So thank you. As my um, biography indicates, my time at the AHA goes back to a point when we had only a print publishing program. Um, this, in fact, was the um, full extent of our publication program when I first started at the AHA. At the time, I was brought in to help put ink on paper using one of the first PCs purchased by the AHA, and largely because I had a little bit of experience with databases. But it has not been a simple or easy journey, and unlike the two previous speakers. I guess I'd like to discuss a little bit both some of our successes as I see it, but also some of our disappointments um, by way of highlighting some of the opportunities and challenges facing societies and humanities. Um, as a historian, I can't resist providing a bit of historical context. Um, because you can see when I started the AHA, we, our publishing program encompassed an array of serial publications, short monographs, and study aids. For all practical purposes, this um, publication differed very little in size, uh, beyond size, um, from the publication program of the AHA a full century earlier. Um, but whereas today, I think our publications program truly is changed. Alongside the print publications of a quarter century ago, our program today encompasses a website, a blog, ebooks, and an array of social media sites. And perhaps more importantly, we now think in terms of a much wider array of interactions that go well beyond our membership. While print publications still retain a central place in terms of content, they're increasingly only one part of a much wider communications program with members and others intended, uh, interested in the history discipline. 
I think the expanded publications program is intended to, and quite frankly is, helping us to uh, fulfill our original mission, um, which goes back to 1889 when we were first chartered by Congress. Until recently, our organization had largely focused its efforts and its um, interests, really, on serving the academic community. Even today, they comprise two-thirds of our membership. But the web and social media have opened up new opportunities that fit in with a larger redefinition of the range and reach of our organization. While serving our academic constituency in new ways, we're now trying to reach out to an array of new audiences and new constituencies. Taken collectively, our online publishing program has significantly extended our reach, and it might help to demonstrate the effect that the web has had on the execution of our mission by a simple count of the number of interactions with the work and materials of the association. As you can see here, our print distribution, although well, it actually shows going up a little bit, um, our print distribution has really sort of peaked at about 350,000 units of our objects that are going out to people per year. Um, but when you count the number of unique visitors that we now reach annually through a variety of other internet-based resources, our total uh, reach to individuals out in the, uh, the larger world has increased substantially to over 4 million unique contacts per year. And of course, that's using Google Analytics, so you can sort of make, make your own judgment as to how valid that is. Um, but one of the great surprises in my analysis of the various online rela relationships we have is the relatively limited overlap between the various user communities that seem to exist online. The vast majority of the people we are connecting to on the web are not members of the association, but equally important, each of the different communities on the web seem substan substantially different from the others. At the sort of gross risk of overgeneralization, the active members of our LinkedIn community, for instance, seem largely to be consist of people with bachelor's degrees and master's degrees who are interested in um, uh, employment in a history-related job. In comparison, the Twitter community tends to be a fairly elite group, although they would insist that they're not, I'm sure, um, often comprised of younger historians and the technologically engaged. And our Facebook community often seems largely comprised of people with only a casual or avocational interest in history, though we're often surprised that history departments also seem to be very active on there, and it's now currently one of the most, the largest drivers of traffic to our site from, uh, from social media spaces. And again, a source of a sore point for many of my Twitter friends, I know. Um, but, and I recently assisted with a uh, survey of one of our affiliated societies, an organization of public historians, which demonstrated the diversified nature of information consumption in our discipline. While the survey was focused on the future of, of their journal, the survey also asked their members about their wider in con uh, information consumption needs and found that three quarters of the respondents relied on three, source, three information sources or more um, for their news about their field. As you can see here, the members of the community still tend to value print and web 1.0 sources most highly, as only the journal, newsletter, and listserv were significantly valued by more than half of its members. But as you can see, a fairly new blog for the organization already has a large number of adherents, and other social media sites still have a small but significant constituency. A key takeaway of uh, from this, because um, I was on a task force sort of assigned to help uh, assist the journal in deciding what it's in the organization and what its future would be, is that we need to work across a wide array of different media channels to reach our audiences. So at present, I see the shift into social media as the future of our social communications efforts. But before I get there, I want to talk briefly about some of our past experiments, uh, perhaps as a caution against anything else that I might say here since I was largely responsible for, or significantly responsible for many of them. Um, my earliest attraction to new media flowed from the idea that technology could open up new ways of telling history, which is to say new kinds of arguments using new kinds of evidence and tools. And then guided by Roy Rosenzweig at the Center for History and New Media, we were fairly early in setting up an online web presence. Um, and I should say, this is actually a version of our website from 1999. We no longer have any images, as far as I can tell, of our website pre-1999. I rely on the Internet Archive for this, and that gets to an issue I'd like to touch on in just a second. But anticipating that the online environment would facilitate new kinds of scholarship, scholarship that was fundamentally transformed by the medium, and opening up new kinds of arguments and interplay between analysis and evidence, in 1999, the AHA partnered with a number of organi other organizations to create two new types of facilities for online publication, working with the University of Illinois Press, National Academies Press, and the Journal of American History, 
we helped establish and underwrite the History Cooperative, an online platform for history journals. And around the same time, we partnered with Columbia University Press and the Columbia University Libraries under a generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to create the Gutenberg E Project, an innovative uh, effort to convert dissertations into scholarly monographs. At least in my memory, both projects were among the most exciting and innovative that I've had the pleasure to work with in my time at the AHA. And for a time, others in the humanities looked to these two projects as models at the cutting edge. Unfortunately, after about five years, we quickly discovered two rather serious problems. The first was money, and the second was support from the field. While trying to maintain a low subscription rate for both institutions and members, we could not pour sufficient front funds into the projects to help sustain them in the face of rapid technological change. And among our members, we struggled to get authors who were really interested in actually doing something new and innovative with the medium. As a result, we ended up with two significant problems. Both projects began to wither as technological changes rapidly outpaced our ability to support them. For instance, the History Cooperative, after about seven years, we had enough articles in there that the search engine became effectively fairly useless, and a growing number of people would complain to us about the fact that this was no longer valuable, that the, you couldn't search, you couldn't discover, you'd type in Lincoln and you could find any number of things, very few of which actually had something to do with the you know, 16th President of the United States. So, as a result, we began to sort of, uh, sort of rethink our, our, some of our efforts in this area. And to make matters worse, we also discovered the challenges of legitimating and maintaining the work that we were trying to create that actually made full use of the medium. Uh, on the one hand, Gutenberg E, we found that it took substantial amounts of effort to get journals to simply review the books. You know, we'd send these a link out, and they had no idea really what to do with it. And we had spent years sort of working with journal editors, said, you know, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get these things, you're going to get links, and you'll hopefully be able to review them. And these letters would go to the journals, and they'd sort of be deeply puzzled by what these things were and how to sort of simply pass them along to, to authors. And the same thing happened in the departments. We were struck that the departments were willing, in most cases where somebody came up for tenure with one of these Gutenberg e-books, they were able to receive tenure, which well, by our original measure, that was the success that we were hoping to, to achieve with that project. But in most cases, the authors felt deeply unhappy that their articles, their books weren't getting reviewed. And because there were a number of issues that got played into the, the larger purpose of the project, for instance, trying to legitimate and uh, independent historians, we ended up bringing a lot of non-academic historians into the project as well. And so it, it ended up really confusing what was going on um, in the larger project. And it took a lot of effort on, at a very personal level with each of the departments, letters from Bob Darton, letters from the, all of us who were involved in the project to say, really, these are books, they've been vetted, they've been reviewed by a blue ribbon sort of group of people, and you need to take these things seriously. They're not, just because they don't exist in this physical form, they are not illegitimate in a, in a way that, uh, that you might think. So, and then the other issue that we discovered is that in the case of the AHR, the additive materials necessary to enhance the works could be very hard to maintain. Um, particularly as the technologies that they were created in began to grow old and degrade. At the same time, uh, we discovered that the materials for born digital AHR articles, which lived on servers outside our control, could get turned off and simply disappear. And part of the reason I only have an image of the logo of the History Cooperative is that it was turned off about three months ago, um, taking a large amount of content that we had created in sort of born digital space. I've been sort of focusing on uh, places like the uh, Valley of the Shadow Project, which has an article sort of worrying about whether those servers might get turned off, never thinking that this project that we had worked on with Illinois and uh, the National Academies of Press might get turned off. Um, and that got turned off, so uh, par partially because we stepped away from it uh, for reasons that I'd like to get in just a second. Um, at, so at the end of it all, I think we found that the uh, little and at the end of it all, we found very little movement and interest in the adoption of new technologies. In a survey I did of members in 2010, I found that while substantial numbers of historians are using an array of technologies in their own work, they still largely see history as a medium of words and hence of the printed page, and they're deeply concerned about the sort of scholarly pre prestige of publication online. And that, I'm afraid, is still where we, is where we stand uh, today as far as innovation in the area of scholarship is concerned. And quite frankly, that has made me a bit wary about getting too far ahead of the curve of our membership once again. I recognize that many people view the elimination of print as a key to solving many of the cost impediments to open access, 
but I've conducted a number of surveys and found very little interest in an e-only option among those who currently pay our bills. In AHA surveys of members and a separate survey of the members of the National Council on Public History, I found that well over 80% want the print version to provide their initial reading experience of the journal. And there is very little difference between the age cohorts in this question. Many members seem perfectly willing to dispense with the print version after the initial reading and to rely on the digital version as an archive, but the print and digital forms are clearly serving two different needs and two needs that we can't ignore. Given that, the AHA has been wrestling with the issue of open access for more than a decade now and has yet to find a happy balance between the revenue needs of our journal and our desire to reach the widest possible audience for our content. Over the past 15 years, the uh, association experimented with a number of different types of open access in an effort to find that balance. For better or worse, at present, we've settled on a policy that makes all articles open after three years and allows authors to post a toll-free link to the published article on their personal website or institutional repository. The association's efforts in this area have gone through three sort of distinct phases. In 1997, the association revised all of its author contracts to allow author self-archiving, only, though only a handful of authors, mostly members aligned with the digital humanities, took us up on the offer. Then in 1999, as we kicked off the History Cooperative, we made the articles, the entire issues, completely free for the first year. Unfortunately, the subscriptions to the publication fell 8.5% during the year in which the entire issue was made freely available. To some extent, I think the drop could be attributed to a trend that had begun with the journal's first availability in JSTOR. With immediate access to much of the reviews run online, our studies found that institutions with more than one subscription made the entirely rational decision to cancel uh, redundant subscriptions. But the drop during the year of open access was notable as the largest annual drop in the time we'd kept records. So the association closed access again to all but members and subscribers. Subscriptions stabilized in the following two years and actually rose briefly until the association made journal content available through EBSCO. In 2005, the AHA Council decided to experiment with a different form of open access, making all the articles open immediately upon publication, but keeping the book reviews, which comprise about half the journal's content, closed. The decision was premised on the moral good of assuring broad and democratic access to scholarship, but we also had done some research on historians' reading habits and discovered that most of them read the journal from back to front, starting with the book advertisements and the reviews, and only eventually returning to read articles of interest. Unfortunately, we quickly discovered that libraries did not share our sense of priorities about the journal's content, and institutional subscriptions dropped a little over 18% after the decision, until we raised a one-year gate on the articles uh, again in 2009. Our par part of our reasoning for that was that our publisher at the time, which is the University of Chicago Press, actually contacted buyers at a variety of different libraries, and, and they were fairly forthright in saying, look, I just clicked on this. I can get this article. I, why should I pay you for, to give me something that I can already get? So um, that, in consultation with Chicago, was part of our reason for raising the gate again. Um, the open access policy also had a very interesting effect on the reading pattern of the digital content. The number of readers entering the journal quickly increased by about a third, which certainly validated our desire to reach a wider audience. But the time spent reading articles plummeted from an average of seven minutes on the site to barely a minute and a half, as most of the new readers left seconds after landing on the page. It quickly became apparent that even if the content was more discoverable, access to the content did not make it more accessible beyond a fairly specialized audience. Given the drop in subscriptions and evidence of a relatively limited audience for the articles, the AHA Council walked back a bit from the open access policy, first by adding a one-year gate to the articles and then by shifting to a three-year moving wall. And as you can see, that stabilized our subscription sales. We also revised author agreements and currently provide a toll-free link to the published articles that the author may post up on their websites or in an institutional repository. And I personally recognize that that's not a very acceptable or not an acceptable alternative to the open access community. But I think it's important um, to have the article in a single place to assure that we're not splitting up the links to the article and thereby lowering its uh, Google rankings and hence its discoverability. As a result of the challenges in this area, we're currently lagging, I think, in the area of developing new online scholarship. But we are instead moving ahead to meet uh, our members and more, those more generally interested in history where they are. We've been posting content from our magazine Perspectives uh, on History since 1995, mostly in ungated form. And in 2006, we started a blog which covers an array of history-related topics. And we followed that with spaces on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter over the past five years. 
I put this chart together, this sort of lame chart, um, in an effort to visualize the array of relationships and interactions currently taking place within our various publication and scholarly communications programs. The print publications still serve as the centerpiece of our various programs, feeding content out to an array of online repositories and setting up a variety of conversations across a range of social media sites. We've also started to generate a significant amount of online content on our website and blog that occasionally now feeds content back into our print publications. As part of this change, the organization also had to accept a significant internal cultural shift. When I first took over as editor of the organization's mag uh, magazine Perspectives in 1991, my role was simply to take pixels or take uh, text that somebody else had, was providing me and put it on the page. So it was a very, you know, it was editor, but it was a very sort of minor role in the sense. Um, today, it's simply impossible, I think, for an organization that wants to be fully engaged and agile in a social media environment to, uh, and which, want, uh, which requires a relationship with a much wider array of interest occurring at a much faster pace and in a space where information is incredibly transient. Um, I think it requ has required, and I've been very fortunate in being able to cultivate a staff of a variety of different sort of professional skill levels, so not just people with PhDs, people that when I first started the AHA never would have been allowed to speak sort of in the name of the AHA, who are now able to participate. And I think we've been able to cultivate a really good sort of voice for our various social media enterprises that allows us to sort of speak in a sort of authoritative way, but without, I think, sort of diminishing our, uh, our sort of presence within sort of the various spaces that, that, uh, that exist out there. So as we look ahead, we're trying to develop spaces within the AHA website that will allow members to participate in this content creation and more generally participate in scholarly exchanges with a select set of their peers. So one example of what we have in mind, what we're currently developing right now, is a new section of the AHA website to get dedicated to teaching. And in some ways, I think the, I mean, part of my sort of emerging thinking on this is that scholarship is, I think, much more uh, stayed and much more static in some ways, but that the practices of historians are much more flexible and that one of my efforts when I first became the editor of the, the Perspectives was, and in terms of trying to cultivate content, was to try and make it a true sort of uh, complement to the American Historical Review. The AHR being focused solely on new scholarship. For me, I tried to develop Perspectives into a publication and now these other social media sites where we actually really focus on what we have in common as historians. Because too often the AHR, um, people, and I do these surveys of peop people who quit the AHA, people will quit because they see, they define themselves incredibly narrowly as historians. I'm a German, 19th century German social historian, and there's only one article a year and maybe five reviews that I really want to read in this narrow niche that I define myself as. And I think as I developed perspectives, it was really intended to say, what do we have in common as historians? It's we're interested in, in our audience. We're interested in the way we teach. And I think that's really where we've tried to develop and cultivate a new set of, um, of areas. And that's why I think a teaching-oriented uh, site is probably going to be a stronger um, sort of space for us to try and develop materials that are, in, that are integrating both static and dynamic content. Um, so as you can see, we've got... Uh, here an effort to try and create um, text sections that are static where we're trying to create um, sort of teaching tips and sort of discussions of, of big questions that will be developed by a, a board of editors and then a set of discussion areas that will sort of both interpenetrate and then will be able to develop out on their own in uh, a separate social media site. We're currently using Higher Logic as our uh, sort of social media software simply because we weren't able to jump on the MLA Commons uh, train fast enough. So, um, so anyway, so that's kind of where we are right now. Um, it's a sort of rough rundown of, of the different spaces that we currently exist in. And I hope to uh, carry this on in the discussion. Thanks. So questions? Anybody comments? Hi. Um, my name is Janet Landay, and I'm at the College Art Association, uh, which is I think behind your organizations in developing uh, the use of digital media for the association itself, but very much engaged uh, in planning in that direction. And one of the research projects w that I'm involved with has to do with copyright of images in general, but I wanted to ask each of you or any of you about online challenges and copyright, I think especially images, although I'd be interested in text as well. 
Thanks. Needless to say, there are enormous challenges around fair use, um, online rights, and images. I mean, it's one of the things that's held up a lot of the conversion of traditional print publications to electronic publications has been having to re-obtain the rights to any images that have been used in those texts. Um, so, I mean, this is this is a challenge that I'm hoping that maybe scholarly societies could come together and work together on to really think about how we can argue for the fair use rights to the images that we're using. There are certain projects like Art Store that are attempting to sort of circumvent that issue by by providing access in a more controlled manner, um, but I'm not sure that it's really solving the problem. Um, of copyright around these issues for us. So, I mean, it's it's enormous and it's something that we would love to work with you on. I, I feel pretty ill-equipped to answer that. Um, it's just, you know, I'm not a librarian and I, I know I struggle with the same questions you raise myself and um, especially as a faculty member when I have my students do, I've had my students do projects using Omeka and, you know, they struggle with copyright and image, image use. Um, and, and the projects that SAH has developed um, Sahara and and uh, Archipedia again use this kind of very controlled environment model, um, and and all the copyright stuff is dealt with within the the environment. So I, I agree. I think it would be a great thing for for learned societies to get together and deal with it. And, I, and perhaps some of them already are, but I think it, I can't say much more about it than that. Yeah, and, and I'll plead ignorance as well. I mean, we really struggle. One of the fights I regularly have with our review, the staff at the American Historical Review, is that they keep arguing that. You know, we can't put PDFs up there because our rights are only for 72 DPI images. I don't know why they insist on getting that, but they only get these 72 DPI image permissions. And so um, even putting the PDFs up there cause problems um, in foreign, and every time we deal with a, another publisher. And so I'll, I'll say that's the extent of my knowledge of the copyright problems. Now, one more thing that I would add quickly is that the Society for Cinema and Media Studies has had extraordinary success um, in arguing for rational policies for fair use of still images from media texts, from film and video, and of um, the use of clips in teaching and in digital projects. Society for Cinema and Media Studies, SCMS. Um, they have a couple of really fantastic um, public policies that they've put forward um, and have really done some, some great intervention with the Library of Congress in order to get um, certain kinds of circumvention of DRM um, made legal for scholars working in those fields. So it's, it's really worth looking at the stuff that they're doing. Hi, I want to follow up on the copyright point. I'm Kenny Cruz. I deal with copyright issues here and elsewhere. And, and on the issue of fair use, I think we can have a much better answer to that question today than we had about five years ago because we have the benefit of some court decisions that have come down in recent years that help us tremendously. And, and I do think that fair use, you know, I don't, want, I don't want the recording to say he got up there and said it's all fair use. <laughs> I, I, but I do want the recording to say that he got up there and said there's a good case to make for fair use. And, and, and it will involve not having things perfect by somebody's measure. It may involve small size, low resolution. But I do think that there's room to explore and in a really solid legal analytical fashion develop a, 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 a rational, useful, and defensible position that as an organization you could take. And, and, and it's important for you to be engaged in, and to be advocates on this issue uh, because you are the leaders in this field. And so I would like very much to see you move forward in your name of your associations. Thank you. Thanks for your presentations. My name's Kate Wolfson and I work for a company called Ithaca SNR. And I was struck by, um, I guess, what was common about all the challenges you shared, which is this problem of if we create it, why don't they come? Um, and I wanted to ask about the humanities aspect of this and it seems like there's a big split between the content that's going up on the one hand and the argument aspect of it. So there's this called the communication aspect and then the content sharing aspect. And I wondered if you could just comment at all on um, whether you think these are, whether there's something unique to humanities here or whether there's um, maybe examples or the science is doing this better. 
are they doing it worse? Um, something of that nature. Thank you. I think the biggest difference is money. <laughs> because basically we're trying to do this on a shoestring to begin with and as we learned with a couple of our other projects it it takes money to create these things it takes money to sustain these things and when we're doing it on a shoestring and it's next to impossible to make these things work without some somebody's investment in in making these things possible when you add to that a certain ambivalence about amongst our memberships among our constituencies about the, what they're going to do with these things. I mean, I, I've, I was saying to Diane, about 10 years ago, I put together a conference, a pre-meeting conference at our meeting about entering the second stage of digital scholarship. And I felt at that point, you know, we had the History Cooperative, we had Gutenberg E, there were a bunch of other projects that were just sort of kicking off. And I felt like, you know, we were on this rocket ship that was sort of leading to this inevitable, you know, magic land of you know, beautiful scholarship that was really going to do something new and inter interesting with the uh, the medium. And I look back now and I think, what could I possibly have been thinking? I mean, and I don't know whether it's because we were too too early and this represents the future, or whether I've become sort of tired and jaded and I just need to find something else to do with my life because uh, <laughs> it, it is really dispiriting. Well, I just wanted to respond first to the question before the last one about um, the role that learned societies can and perhaps should take um, with regard to advocacy, whether it has to do with copyright or the other thing that we've heard a lot lately is that um, learned societies should be taking a stronger advocacy role with trying to get universities, um, specifically um, promotion and tenure committees at various levels of universities, to think differently about um, digital scholarly communication. And I think it's a really fascinating one, and I'm glad that it was raised because, you know, I, I, I think it's something that we've talked about, I know, a lot at SAH over the past six years or so, and thinking about what, can, what role can SAH play in this important sort of space of dialogue about um, these critical issues right now. And this, I think, links to that to the second question and to what Robert just said, which is that when I think about how SAH operates, and again, it's it's a medium to maybe small, small compared to College Art Association, small compared to MLA, Learned Society, that does fortunately have benefit of an excellent paid staff, but it's a relatively small paid staff, and pretty much everything else we do runs on incredibly dedicated volunteer time. And I just, uh, toward the end of my, again, maybe I was getting jaded, but toward the end of my time as president, I really was starting to think, how much more can we do? And I, I, you know, I think we need to keep working on the advocacy, and I think there is an important, because learned societies are visible in ways, of course, that their individual members are not, and, and now that we have these digital platforms, we have the potential to reach wider audiences. But one of the things that um, I became aware of, and this links to the content versus communication and sharing question, is that we were so frantically busy for six years building these things and getting them up and running and trying to, I mean, we went from you know, zero to 200 miles an hour in a very short period of time. We were a group of architectural historians who knew very, very little about the digital world in 2006. And I can say now, our executive director is an extremely tech-savvy individual now. She's really good at this stuff and really knows how to talk about it and think about it and conceptualize about it. But all that said, we were so busy working on it that we didn't even really have time to talk about it in any kind of a public way for a long time, which I think in some ways led our funder, the Mellon Foundation, to sometimes wonder about the achievements um, of these projects because we weren't able to step back and really analyze what yeah. we had achieved. I think that's happening now. Um, and I think we can say this worked, this maybe was not so successful. But so when I, all those two questions for me tie together because I think um, there are some big learned societies that have a greater capacity to take on these really crucial advocacy issues than others. But I, I, again, maybe also a cautionary tale is thinking about um, the, the cost, the human hours cost of producing this kind, these kinds of um, projects in smaller societies. It's not insignificant. And so there's a limit, I think, to sort of what we can expect such societies to take on at the same time that we need to keep talking about it. So I guess this is the point where I get to step into my role as um, irrational optimist. Um, 
around questions like this. I, I think that there is a lot that scholarly societies can do, but I think that on some level, um, what we haven't done yet is achieve the kinds of economies of scale that will allow us to do them. And that's one of the things that we're really hoping to be able to do with MLA Commons. Um, as I mentioned, one of our interests is to be able to open this platform to other organizations who can't necessarily support a platform for themselves like this, that we can bring the resources of the MLA and we can bring resources together across the societies to be able to support um, a broader kind of conversation across the humanities um, in, in these sorts of uh, new arenas and new platforms. I do think that there are some differences um, between the ways that um, scholarly communication has developed in the sciences, in the social sciences, and in the humanities that has a lot to do with the nature of what the work is, right? Um, that, that, that the the work in the sciences on some level is doing the science and the stuff that gets communicated afterwards is the record of its having been done, right? Where in the humanities, the work is the thing that is communicated. And it produces a really distinct relationship between the author and the article, the author and, and the, the audience that they're attempting to reach. And because of this, I think there's been, um, in part because of investment in science, there's been a real emphasis on speed, um, on needing to get things out fast and get them up taken, up taken, taken up, up. Um, <laughs> fast, and and getting you know your lab's work out before that other lab that you know is working on the same problem, right? So the the culture of preprint distribution begins to arise out of that need to get your work out there first to make sure that your lab, your colleagues are the ones who get credit for a particular kind of discovery. In the humanities, we have a less of that kind of time pressure in terms of making sure that we're the one to lay claim to something in particular. But on the other hand, there, there are other fields where the circulation of preprints or of working papers, um, in, in working papers in economics, um, preprints in, in legal studies, I mean, these are, these are increasingly important means of getting work out well in advance of the formal structures of publication. And I think we're starting to see the leading edge of that in the humanities as well. And one of the things that I think that the humanities can bring to the table um, that the sciences and the social sciences have not yet really crossed over into, where I think, frankly, we're out ahead, is in utterly reimagining what the nature of scholarship can be, right? That it need not be the monograph and the journal article, that there are other forms that projects can take. They can take the form of Omeka exhibits. They can take the forms of, of of scalar multimedia projects. It can take the form of databases and archives and all kinds of stuff where the sciences in their modes of communication are still very, very fixated on this object that is the journal article, however it's distributed. distributed. So I think you know we, we in the humanities bring a lot to the table. I think we do, however, need to do a better job of collaborating um, in order to get to a place where all of the societies can participate in the kinds of advocacy work that, that the large ones right now are able to do. Rebecca Kennison, uh, Center for Digital Research and Scholarship here at Columbia, was trying to decide which of the thousand questions that I had for you I was going to do, but I'm going to follow up on, on Kathleen's and say, um, scholars, scholarly societies, uh, most of your members are um, at institutions, are academics, are uh, people who have other connections within the institutions, and I'm wondering, if you could speak to um, the possibilities for collaboration, not just among societies, but between societies and, and, and various institutions, and what in particular we might do to work together with you. A number of the Born Digital articles that we created for the AHR were all created, I mean the best ones, with the exception of the one that disappeared with the, um, the added to material that was uh, disappeared with the History Cooperative, was created at sites off of um, outside of the AHR because we weren't able to, to take the material, you know, the different um, softwares that uh, made this possible. So they exist now. So that I think there are four or five sort of born digital articles that exist somewhere outside of the AHR. They exist at USC and at um, UVA. I'm blanking on where the others are. But our other, our concern is that we're facing the same sort of the potential extinction, extinction of these articles that, uh, that we faced with uh, the History Cooperative. That in the case of the USC article, for instance, somebody 
said, why is this server on? And turned it off one day. And we ended up, an article in the AHR disappeared. Um, and so that's something I've, and I've spent a lot of time trying to work with different sort of experts in the field, um, Portico, uh, some other groups to say like, so what, what can we do to make sure that there's some version of this that continues to exist? And usually, once again, it comes down to, sure, we'll, we'll take it and we'll put it in a form, but you give us some money. Um, and it also deals with relationships with all these, these different organizations. And so I've, I've found that it difficult in a lot of, in a lot of ways that, that uh, I hadn't really thought about. So. I think the collaboration question is a really fascinating one. And as far as I know, um, and I, I can't think of, I know, for example, as the SAH director is in very close contact with the director of some other learned societies, especially CAA and so on. But I think that the question of collaboration may be less about, um, as for me, perhaps less about the things, the synergies that can come from having learned societies collaborate, as it is from thinking about how the projects we're developing may begin to necessitate and seem to begin to necessitate different kinds of collaborative research practices for scholars. And so, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, for example, to me about Sahara is that it didn't end up doing some of the things we thought it was going to do, but there are potentials there and new ways that people are using it that I don't think we imagined. So, for example, um, one of the ways we are going to use it is that it's becoming a repository for um, old color slide collections that we can't, we don't know, we can't get them all cataloged and taken care of, but at least they can be put in there until something else can be done, and so that's kind of a new project. But once that happens, I mean, so, so we're imagining that um, very soon um, Sahara will have about 100,000 images in it, which is not anything compared to a huge, you know, a very large one, a digital image repository like ArtStore, but it's very large. But if you think about what is now available to scholars, and this is something that our um, past president, Dietrich Neumann, talked about when we were first beginning Sahara, is the idea that it's, it's now possible for art and architectural historians to begin to do um, quantitative research on images and to begin to think about what's out there as big data. And in the art and architectural history worlds, that's not something that people have been doing very much about. We're just starting to think about what having access to big data that's visual data might mean. And there are people like Lev Manovich who are doing that differently, but people who are sort of practicing more traditional art and architectural history haven't begun to think about it that way yet. And I think that having a resource like Sahara where you have authoritative content, you have really high resolution images, you know that what it says it is is what it is and makes and it's, it's mineable, makes it um, available for different kinds of research that are going to necessitate, I think, collaborative practices for most scholars because of the way that they're going to have to work on it. So collaboration for me is an important piece of these projects, but not necessarily uh, because it's about society to society collaboration as it is about scholarly collaboration. I would just add to that by saying that um, I think uh, one of the points where scholarly societies and um, other institutional structures have very, very common goals. Um, and particularly when I'm thinking of institutional structures, I'm thinking, of course, of institutions like Columbia, but also of the Columbia University Library, is in terms of thinking about um, the scholarly record, how permanent it is, how it's distributed, how people access it, and so forth. And um, so I think there is, there is a great deal of collaboration um, between societies which have access to um, disciplinarily organized members who are producing particular kinds of work um, and the, the libraries and other organizations um, on campuses that are gathering and, and distributing the work. Um, that those scholars are producing. I also think that, um, and you know, coming from the, the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship, um, one of the particular places where there's a, a really important role for institutions like Columbia to play is in R&D basically for new modes of scholarly communication. I think, I think a center like, excellent. <laughs> I think a center like Cedars has a kind of focus on R&D that no scholarly society can really afford to produce on its own, that we have to have partners um, in order to really develop innovative new ways of communicating. And so working with um, digital humanities centers, with library research centers, and so forth is absolutely crucial um, for the path forward. I have a question. Um, 
and I guess a confession, which is that I'm an outgoing chair of one of the divisions for the <laughs> MLA, um, Victorian, um, the Victorian division. And we've had a email conversation recently about whether to use MLA Commons. And there are um, some of the newer members who, I'm not, I'm not sure if they're also the younger members. I mean, I think we're all probably within about 20 years of each other. Um, were sort of open to the idea of trying to use it. And some of us who were retiring um, from the committee had the reaction, which is, if you want to do this, this is great. We'll certainly you know, join up and use it. But many of us suffering from screen fatigue, right? So it's not just, and I don't, another confession, I don't do Facebook, I don't Twitter, I don't do any of those sorts of things. So part, I guess, the the you identified the problem with some of the constituents, right, and um, constituencies of the MLA, but but I guess I'm trying to figure out, and I, I don't want to be a Luddite about this, but, but is there a way that it can be sort of marketed, I suppose, or, or so that I'm not feeling as though it's just one more, one more demand on my screen time? I don't know that marketing can do that, um, but we are working extremely hard on building resources there that will absolutely make it worth any scholar's while um, for participating in these kinds of communities. Um, giving, giving members access to collaborators on projects that they're working on, to feedback on the work that they're doing, um, to new kinds of communities and discussions that their work feeds into and that their work can feed from. Um, and I think that's, that's a really key component of, of what it is that we really want to see MLA Commons doing. Um, and I'll give you a specific example. Mm -hmm. We have had a, 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 a small cluster of members, I mean, you know, and I think about this every time I hear about AHR and the percentage of the volume that's book reviews. Um, you know, we, we have had a small cluster of members who have been after the MLA to publish book reviews oh, part for <laughs> years, right? And for all of the understandable reasons. We need to get more books reviewed. We need to get better circulation out there. But we have 30,000 members, all of whom are publishing books. Right. And we cannot take on the project of publishing book reviews in PMLA because it, you know, PMLA would quadruple in size and we would never be able to publish right. anything else. But 19th century books online. 19th Jim century books online. Well, Jim Heffernan being the key person <laughs> in pushing us to do this. Um, 19th century books online has a really phenomenal model for getting book reviews um, produced and aggregated and communicated. And what we want to do with MLA Commons is to get the division on Victorian literature mm -hmm. to say we are going to take on the project of finding out what the books that are being published in our field are at any given moment. We're going to make sure that somebody is reviewing this book or if we know that there are reviews already out there, we're going to aggregate those reviews and create subfield based book review publications online that would enable us to serve that population that absolutely desperately needs to be served, right. but that something like PMLA just simply cannot take on. Well, something like Jim Heffernan's project, right, He, the idea was that it always was supposed to be online, right, but that because of it was on his shoulders for so long, that this is something that it could be sort of easily moved over to Commons? Absolutely, it could be yeah. moved over extremely easily. And what we're really hoping is to be able to use the Commons space as a means of crowdsourcing that kind of work so that it doesn't fall on the head of any one individual. I don't know how Jim's managed to do it yeah. um, for as long as Ameritas. he has. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> it makes a big difference, right? Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, even, even somebody with that kind of expansive yeah. time can only manage to do so much. But if we can pull more members of the MLA together in doing this kind of project. I think we can do something pretty neat. I have two questions. I was wondering whether there is a directory of email addresses of scholars and also what actually divides the humanities from the social sciences or rather what divides the content of the humanities from the content of the social sciences? Those are big questions. Um, there is not any singular directory of scholars. I think, you know, societies have their various directories. Um, it's possible to search the member directory of the MLA on the website if you're a logged in member, 
Um, but that information is not, I mean, we don't want to put our, our members' email addresses out there willy-nilly. Um, so, so there are certain kinds of restrictions on that. Academia.edu has some information. Um, you know, university websites have their own directories, but there isn't any, like, single coherent um, directory that I know of. In terms of the distinction between the humanities and the social sciences, um, I am going to take a stab at this. This is the first time I've attempted to do this, so please feel free to shoot me down and tell me I'm completely wrong about this. I think it's fundamentally, for me, an orientation toward evidence that's different between the social sciences and the humanities, where the humanities are, are very focused on a mode of argumentation that's about interpretation and sort of the, the production of an argument about that interpretation. Social, the social sciences seem frequently to have more of a, an empirical approach to analyzing what is found in the evidence um, that's less interpretive though there is always interpretation involved in analysis. So I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an epistolo uh, that that epistemological that difference. Yeah. The social sciences, I think, I think you're right about that in some ways because history is one of those disciplines that has been on the cusp for quite a long time. And we have moved from the social sciences to the humanities largely because we're moving away, from, we've moved away from quantitative history and we've become much more literary in our sort of approaches to, to mm -hmm. sort of presentation as well. And so I think that's made a, a big part of the... The division is ambiguous. It's extremely ambiguous because there's a field like anthropology, right, right. Um, which is in certain ways very clearly a social science and very clearly um, empirically oriented and yet is always about the interpretation of culture in ways that bear a lot in common with the humanistic enterprise. Um, I think, I mean, and then there are fields like sociology where, which have qualitative methods and they have quantitative methods both contained within the same field, though a great division between the two. So. I think uh, it's, it, it is a murky distinction and one that has more to do with institutional structures, yeah. I think, than it does with um, actual differences in fields of knowledge. And in a lot of cases, it comes back down to money again. I know a lot of history departments that, have fight, that fight to the bitter end to stay within the School of Social Science so that they can get higher salaries. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, One of the things I do is to help run the, um, and actually this year I'm directing the uh, Hyman Center for the Humanities, and we're about to launch a four-year series on evaluation, value, and evidence in the disciplines. Um, and the first one actually will be in April about medicine, the humanities, and the human sciences. But precisely taking up the question of, you know, that every humanities and the social sciences and the hard sciences all have methods of evaluation and and standards of evidence, but what they are um, and how much different modes are valued within the disciplines obviously change a lot. Right? Go ahead. Um, my question was just yeah about um, for the panelists looking at you know, the presentations of the other panelists and thinking about collaboration across uh, scholarly societies. H how much of the needs of your own society or constituencies do you feel are discipline specific, and then how much really does um, do many of the humanistic disciplines share in common, and how does that manifest in the different scholarly communication needs of your members? I think that's a great question because one of the, oh, well, there's at least two pieces of that that I think are, are really interesting. And one is that, um, I, you know, disciplinary boundaries are really in flux, I think, right now. And if they're not, they probably should be. <laughs> um, and my colleague at University of Chicago, um, Jim Chandler, who runs the Frankie Institute for the Humanities, has been running a long Mellon-funded project. That's, that's our disciplines project. It come, comes out comes from out that we're great. collaborating with. Yeah. That's such a great project. And there's wonderful information on the website about that that I would direct you to to look at. But I think that this whole digital revolution is also really causing scholars in my field and in others, I think, to think differently about where the edges of their disciplines are. And, and it, I, Kathleen gave such a great answer to that last question about definitions of the humanities and social sciences, because she pointed to the ways in which 
there is this ambiguity, and I think the digital makes those, those ambiguities somewhat more amplified or profound. Um, and so within my own scholarly society, well, within this, and I belong to multiple scholarly societies because I work across, I mean, so I'm an architectural historian, that's my degree, but I work on lands, cultural landscape history, I work on histories of cities, I work in visual culture, and material culture, things you can see and touch are sort of what I work on in spaces. So I, I increasingly have trouble defining what I do. There's no one learned society that fits exactly what I need now. Um, so I travel among them. And they're mostly not talking to each other right now, a whole lot, right? So they, they are developing um, some projects in isolation. I think they're trying to start to talk to each other. They're most, because of the kinds of work I do, they're mostly quite small. I, SAH is big compared to, say, the Society of American City and Regional Planning Historians or the Vernacular Architecture Forum or, uh, well, Urban History Association is probably larger. But so, uh, you know, the, the extent to which the ind things like the first one I mentioned, Society of American City and Regional Planning Historians, they don't have a paid uh, staff. So when they think about building something, they might be more interested in working with a learned society that's already built some sort of digital platform that they might find useful or coming over to talking to you at MLA and seeing what you're doing. But I, I don't know yet whether or not there's, I think that a lot of learned societies are still just trying to figure out what the heck this thing is, this new digital, I mean there's, so, I mean I'm always struck by the fact that when I'm in conversations like this, librarians have a really high level of knowledge about what's happening in the digital scholarly world. Um, and when we go to the scholarly communications institutes, there's these very high level conversations where everybody in the room understands all kinds of acronyms that I didn't understand six years ago. But when I'm out in, on my campus and I'm talking to faculty in the English department or the history department, there's an enormous amount of skepticism still, I find, about digital humanities. Um, a lot of anxiety that's produced about it. Um, a lot of fear about, oh, that's where all the money's going and I'm not going to have money for what I do. Um, uh, and just confusion still about what it all is about. And so I think there are still a lot of conversations that need to happen in a lot of different ways in a lot of different venues before we start to see um, smaller learned societies that could make use of what you all are doing or what you all are doing coming together and collaborating in the ways that you're starting to suggest would be profitable. But I'm often struck in the social media spaces that I participate in at how much sort of cross-disciplinary discussion goes on. In some ways, that, that for me is why I still find this incredibly exciting, is that I see that sort of cross-pollination going on, whereas when I then read surveys that I get back from members, former members, I'm struck at how narrow they define themselves. So I mean, it, there's this sharp contrast between, and I don't mean to knock our members either, but, um, but I mean, there's, there's this sort of narrowness about a lot of people in our, our disciplines who define themselves, you know, and we get in these fights with our directory of history departments quite regularly, where you can't just use five words to describe what this person's specialization, and you need to use at least 12, you know, and it's got to get right down to this incredibly narrow detail, and that's the only thing that can truly describe what this person does. And meanwhile, on the, the social media spaces, I'm, you know, I'm interacting with people who are doing really fascinating stuff that really runs uh, across quite a few boundaries that mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, and are not stuck even within the discipline and I think that's what's really exciting. I, I would completely agree with that. Yeah. I think it's extraordinarily exciting. Wow. I mean, it, it was, you know, one in the same time, um, I'm not going to say that it was frustrating. It was, it was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, and and a real source of excitement that no sooner had we launched MLA Commons than I started getting immediate pushback from our members saying, but I'm also a member of SCMS and I really need to be able to form a group that's working on this question that's both members of MLA and members of SCMS and how can I do that within a network that's really focused on the MLA? Um, so I think you know we really have to find ways to create this space where members can kind of cross those disciplinary boundaries and actually talk to one another about the projects that they're working on and maybe maybe we might be able to get beyond this incredible hyper specialization um, if we do that. I'm uh, right. Mark Daly. I'm a library intern here at Columbia. I attended the booksellers convention last year and heard from some publishers who were uh, really urgently trying to get into the digital space and change their business models. They felt they had very little time left you know to make a transition, a very big transition. On your point of the interdisciplinarity uh, do you feel there's a sense of urgency or should be among the societies? Uh, or is there a chance you're going to miss out on something by not moving quickly? 
I don't know if the situation is completely analogous. Um, I think that that our members are pressing us forward, and I think we do need to um, let them press us. I think it's, I mean, we're membership societies, and without them, you know, who is it we're serving? So I think, you know, we, we do need to, to pay very close attention to what it is they're asking of the societies today. Um, but I don't think that there's, there's some way in which you know the, the the thing that we do is going to become extinct. I think that as long as we're listening carefully um, and really attempting to to take note of where the needs are um, and really face down the challenges of doing anything in the higher education sphere in the contemporary um, state of the universe, that you know I think I think we have a bit of time and a bit of goodwill to really work on a good solution rather than necessarily just a fast one.